Time for a little personal history. Like many millennials my age, I grew up watching Cartoon Network. I've watched it for so long that I can remember the time where it was just a channel devoted to Hanna-Barbera's various properties and Carrot Top was somehow a presence in the early mornings. Look out, it's old Bobbo, the neighbor who loves monster truck rallies and eating sand. Ah, uh, the 90s were silly. But out of all the times that I've remembered watching TV in vast quantities, the moments that have stuck out with me the most was whenever I would stay over at one of my grandparents' house for the weekends. It was there I was able to stay up extra late watching the boob tube and access the mysterious world of late night cartoons. You have to remember that this was a pre-adult swim world we're talking about here. There was a period where Cartoon Network kept going after 8pm Eastern. Once Cartoon Cartoon Fridays wrapped up at 11pm, it would then transition to an hour long block of old cartoon anthology shows like Toon Heads and The Bob Clampus Show. Shows that I have mentioned before as being integral in shaping my interest in animation history. This would then give way to an hour of Toonami's Midnight Run, which was the place one could get a lot of uncut anime. Titles like Gundam, Dragon Ball Z, Outlaw Star, and the like. Now, as much of an otaku as I am now, I didn't pay too close attention to these titles. They usually weren't the first episodes, so I often had zero context for what was going on, and most of the anime I was interested in at the time had the word Mon somewhere in the title. But regardless, these moments in time ultimately had a huge effect on me. Maybe it was the workings of my sleep-deprived 10-year-old brain, but for some reason, I really began to associate cartoons from the golden age of American animation with the Japanese cartoons that came out in the 80s and 90s. A lot of people seem to see both as two completely different separate worlds. I bet there's quite a few otaku out there who would refuse to give the classic cartoons the time of day. After all, they're American cartoons that aren't part of the seasonal slate of anime that they are currently downloading off virus-laden streaming sites, so why bother? On the other hand, there's probably some decrepit Terry Toons worshipping boomer out there who just sees anime as this batch of stiff, weird drawings where everyone has the same face, all just because they watched a couple of episodes of Gigantor as a kid. But are the classics of American animation and the classics of Japanese animation really that separate from one another? Like I said before, this could just be the half-remembered memories of Midnight Viewings talking right now, but I really think there is a connection between these two worlds of animation. In fact, I would say we wouldn't even have the anime we know and love today if it wasn't for the influences of these old American cartoons. Not saying that anime would not exist without these cartoons. I'm just saying that anime would be very different if it wasn't for those old-timey cartoons that aired at 1am back in the year 2000. Anime did not spring forth fully formed from the Aether. Lightning did not strike Go Nagai's pen which gave him the power to create stories about giant robots and half-naked girls. It's just that a lot of what we know about anime can be traced back to American animation's golden age. And for those of you wondering if this video is meant to tie my Kyoto video series to my far more popular One Second From Every Classic Looney Tunes video, my answer to you is... Of course it is. What else would this video be? Even before the dawn of film, people from all over the world always had the desire to see their art move. Japan was no exception, already having cultivated a rich culture of performance through projected imagery with utushi -e, a type of magic lantern show that was popular in the 19th century which combined the magic lantern technology of the West with traditional Japanese skills of performance. Already an example of Western influence helping cultivate Japanese culture. By the time the technology of film began to take the world by storm, people from all over the world were trying to see if the moving pictures concept could be applied to actual pictures. One of these early experiments was Katsuro Shashin, a three second animated film consisting of a boy writing the kanji for the title which translates to moving picture before turning to the audience and giving a salute. There is debate on the date of origin for this film, but it's generally thought to have originated in 1907, making it the oldest surviving anime. From that point onward, the groundwork of anime begins to be laid out by the people who are considered to be the three fathers of anime, Oten Shimakawa, Junichi Koichi, and Setoru Kitayama. Their work shows us a world of anime that is very different than the one we are currently living in, telling traditional Japanese stories and folklore through experimental formats such as paper cutouts and chalkboard drawings. Very little of their work survives today, as most of it was destroyed in the Great Kanto Earthquake of 1923. Meanwhile, across the pond in America, artist Windsor McKay creates Gertie the Dinosaur, the animation that codifies traditional animation by the use of cells. It goes on to inspire the likes of Walt Disney, Ob Iwerks, Walter Lance, and Paul Terry, figures who would be instrumental in shaping the golden age of American animation. Also among the people inspired by McKay were two brothers, Max and Dave Fleischer. 
The sons of poor Jewish immigrants, the two brothers instantly made a name for themselves in 1915 with Max's new invention for animation called rotoscoping. Rotoscoping is a technique that animators use to trace over film frame by frame to produce realistic action. This revolutionary technique in animation allowed Max to start his successful Out of the Inkwell series of cartoons. Thanks to the Fleischer's exclusivity in using the new technology, their rotoscope works easily made them one of the dominant forces in this era of American animation alongside Felix the Cat and the Alice comedies. That is, until 1928, where the balance of power shifted thanks to a new innovation. The introduction of synchronized sound flipped the animated world upside down. Walt Disney and his studio had now emerged as the top dog with their cartoons starring a lovably roguish mouse. It was clear that the other American studios had to play catch up. The Fleischers were quick to adapt to the changes as they too had been experimenting with synchronized sound prior to Steamboat Willie. But it was also clear to them that just setting pictures to sound of music wasn't enough. They needed a star. At the newly minted Fleischer Studios, Max and Dave set to creating a character that could rival Disney's new rodent. At first, they settled on a dog character named Bimbo, but in 1930, in Bimbo's third cartoon, Dizzy Dishes, a new character was introduced that would soon surpass him in popularity, both nationally and internationally. Betty Boop, good at heart while also looking for a good time. Her popularity not just linked to her status as animation's first sex symbol, but also her flapper looks, served as a reminder of the carefree times of yesterday that gave American audiences relief as they grappled with the Great Depression. She also helped the Fleischers set themselves apart from Disney. While Disney's work had a folksier Americana feel to it, the attitude of the Fleischer cartoons was more urban, surreal, and wild, like the swinging nightlife of the city. Since these cartoons recouped their budget a couple of times over in the States, the Fleischers were able to export them all over the world for dirt cheap. The place they found the most success? Japan. Betty Boop was almost an immediate hit in Japan. There have been stories from animators who grew up around this time watching Betty Boop cartoons in home screenings. There was tons upon tons of Betty Boop merchandise produced in Japan during this era. Hayao Miyazaki even did a shout out to Betty Boop shorts in his film Porco Rosso. The Betty Boop craze across the Pacific was so huge that even the Fleischers took notice. In a tribute to their overseas fan base, they made a cartoon short titled A Language All My Own, where Betty flies to Japan to perform for a crowd of adoring fans there. What made the short so unique was the amount of research the Fleischers put in there to make it as true to Japanese culture as they possibly could, even going so far as to hire Japanese language experts and foreign university students to make sure they got it right. The result is a cartoon that feels very respectful to the culture it's involving itself with, or at the very least compared to the other cartoons of that day which were anything but. But there was a huge side effect to the fame of Betty Boop and by extension other American cartoons in Japan. While the Japanese film industry was rolling out the red carpet for American imports, it ultimately left homegrown Japanese animators out in the cold. The reason why the Japanese film industry heavily promoted American animation over locally produced Japanese animation was because the imports were so cheap. Japanese animation, meanwhile, was far more expensive as animators were desperately trying to keep up with the technology. Necessary tools such as multiplane cameras, sound recording equipment, and even animation cells were quite pricey, and no studio was willing to foot the bill. As such, Japanese animation of the time felt very restricted to the realm of the hobbyists, and even the animators that were able to make money off their work such as Kenzo Masaoka often had to turn to making educational films or government propaganda just to secure funding. These animations really show how animators begin adopting techniques originating in America such as squash and stretch. You even begin to see them adopt character designs similar to the ones seen in Fleischer and Disney cartoons. However, it's also very clear that the people working on these are hindered by a lack of resources that Disney and Fleischer didn't have. Plus, their takes on the Fleischer style felt less like influence and more like imitation. Also, the animation technology in America was moving so rapidly and introducing new expensive techniques such as Technicolor made the ones produced in Japan feel years behind the curve. Frankly, it seemed like as long as these American imports came in cheap, Betty Boop, Mickey Mouse, and Fleischer's newest star Popeye the Sailor Man would dominate at the expense of Japanese creations. 
and then a watershed. The Mikado is to his people more than king. As Japan's 124th emperor of a single royal family, he is revered as sacred. The trained, well-equipped hordes of the rising sun march on to conquest. By the late 1930s, the influence of the Japanese military over political policy had reached a fever pitch, culminating in the February 26th incident of 1936, where 1,500 army troops marched on Tokyo in an attempt to assassinate the prime minister and take control of the government. While the attempted coup failed, it signaled a show of greater military influence on civil policy. Ultranationalist statism went mainstream, asserting that Japan was the center of the world and that Asia would only survive the onslaught of the Western powers if it was under Japanese influence. By 1937, the Second Sino-Japanese War had begun and all foreign assets were frozen, meaning no more imports of foreign media, especially animation. The ban on foreign art, as well as the nationalist push for support of Japanese creators only, meant that now Japanese animators could finally get the recognition and resources that they rightfully deserved. However, being that Japan was now a fascist government hellbent on flexing its military might across East Asia, the only things animators could do during this period was propaganda. Stories about young, scrappy heroes from Japanese folklore fighting against the foreign menace that used the formerly popular American cartoon stars as shorthand. The most famous of these was 1943's Momotaro Sea Eagles, which dramatized the attack on Pearl Harbor as a group of small, cute animal soldiers attacking American and British forces as representatives presented by a drunken Bluto XP. This would later lead to the first feature-length Japanese anime, Momotaro Sacred Sailors, a sequel to sea eagles that portrayed the Japanese as noble conquerors who only wished to bring peace and prosperity to the savages of Asia and only wished to invade the western nations as a means to broken a peaceful surrender. Obviously, neither of these films have aged particularly well, but neither has our own propaganda cartoons. Gross. But the funny thing is, is that as much as the Japanese government and military wanted Japanese animation to focus purely on Japanese topics, they still demanded animators to take cues from Western animation studios. Specifically, in the making of the Momotaro series, they demanded that director Mitsuyo Seo take inspiration from the recent Walt Disney feature film Fantasia and see if he could apply those same techniques to their propaganda films. Seo, who was a political prisoner prior to the war thanks to his leftist beliefs, did not refuse them. This period, however, was not to last long. Once World War II ended with Japan's defeat and American occupation, animation pretty much went back to the way it was prior to 1937. Japanese animators got more appreciation than they did before, but American imports were still the default, probably doubly so considering the occupation. That and the then current influx of new animation from America only signaled to the public just how far behind Japan was in the animation arms race. Films like Disney's Pinocchio and Bambi along with the shorts of Warner Brothers and MGM were in a completely different league altogether compared to Japan's output. Still, Japanese animators were still willing to press on despite the uphill battle that faced them ahead. Around this time, Kenzo Masaoka started a studio that would later grow into Toei Animation, which would produce Japan's fully colored animated films by the end of the 50s. Meanwhile, some artists decided to go into the field of manga. It was safer, cheaper, and now a wild west of content thanks to Article 21 of the 1947 Constitution that prohibited all forms of censorship thus ushering in a huge wave of young, creative-minded manga authors to jumpstart the young industry. And one of these authors in particular would go on to change the face of Japanese culture forever. This is the part y'all have been waiting for, right? To say Osamu Tezuka had a significant impact on the world of anime would be like saying Jack Kirby had a significant impact on the world of superhero comics. It almost seems like barely scratching the surface. To a lot of people, he is the reason anime exists today. Not only is he considered this because he founded Studio Mushi, thus inventing the model for anime to get on TV airways in the first place, but he also helped define the general look and feel of anime and manga. 
Metropolis helped inspire stories centered around robots, giant or otherwise. Astro Boy helped inspire stories about young boy heroes fighting against increasingly stronger opponents with each fight having more insurmountable odds. Princess Knight helped inspire stories of pretty young heroines who are thrust in the face of adversity and vow to never give up even when things look bleakest. But his most widely recognized contribution was helping codify and popularize the look that we associate with anime and manga, namely the eyes. Those big, bulbous, beautiful eyes. And it was all thanks to the American cartoons he grew up with. Tezuka never made it a secret that his biggest influences were the works of both Disney and the Fleischer Brothers. I mean, one of his early works was a manga adaptation of Disney's Bambi. Going back to Betty Boop, her cartoons were the well that Tezuka drew the most from when designing his characters. Early Fleischer character designs tended to consist of basic shapes that helped exaggerate proportions and allowed them to emote more freely. This is the principle that Tezuka utilized when designing his characters, especially his female characters. You could definitely see a lot of Betty Boop when looking at characters such as Princess Sapphire or Astro Girl. The Western influence can also be found in his stories. Stories like Astro Boy and Kimba the White Lion take a lot of inspiration from Pinocchio and Bambi, a story about a young artificial child who wishes to be a real boy, alongside a story about a young animal cub who experiences tragedy early in his life and must learn to be a fair and just ruler of his domain. But strangely enough, one of Tezuka's biggest inspirations came from one of the most American sources possible. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. This amazing stranger from the planet Krypton. The Man of Steel. Superman! The Fleischer Superman cartoons, the studio's swan song series, is one of the most technically impressive animated series of that era. If you have any love for Sakuga or just good animation in general, I encourage you to watch these shorts on YouTube because they are all in the public domain. From the look of it alone, you can tell how much Tezuka drew from it. Tezuka's art always had this art deco feel to it, and it's pretty easy to see why because the Superman shorts are just art deco personified. But one short in particular sticks out to me. 1941's The Mechanical Monsters. With a plot centered around Superman battling a mad scientist who has an army of giant robots at his command, one doesn't have to squint hard to see the obvious influences it had on Tezuka's work, such as Metropolis and Astro Boy. I could spend all day listing all the Western cartoons that Tezuka took influence from that would later become the foundation on which many an anime trope was built on. Fleischer Superman influenced Tezuka to create robot-centered storylines such as Metropolis, which in turn influenced Go Nagai to make his Mazinger Z series, which in turn influenced Hideaki Anno to make Gunbuster, which in turn influenced Hiroyuki Yamaishi to make Gurren Lagann. Disney's Pinocchio influenced Tezuka to make Astro Boy, whose feats of strength and overall naivety about the world influenced Akira Toriyama to create the character of Goku, who influenced Masashi Kishimoto to create the character of Naruto Uzumaki, who influenced Kohei Horikoshi to create the character of Izuku Midoriya. The Fleischers created Betty Boop, whose cute, innocent design and plucky demeanor influenced Tezuka to create Princess Sapphire, who in turn influenced the creation of characters such as Usagi Tsukino, who in turn influenced the creation of nearly every Moe protagonist ever. Disney's Bambi influenced Tezuka to create Kimba the White Lion, who in turn influenced Disney to create the Lion King- No, 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 not going there. You get the idea, right? It was thanks to Tezuka's influence from Western media that we now have the tropes of anime that we know and love. And it was true influence, not imitation. He was able to take what he drew from his favorite properties creatively and was able to create stories that he could safely call his own. He had taken what others had tried to do in the past and perfected it. And that's the connection between anime and the golden age of American animation and why one was so important to the other. But this raises another question. What about the animators that came before Tezuka? Animation historians and anime fans in general have a terrible habit of trying to apply great man theory to Osamu Tezuka. In many a simplified history of anime, the beginning is always Tezuka and Astro Boy and nothing more. And while Tezuka was a tour de force with how he helped codify the overall look of anime, how he helped popularize genres, and how he helped mentor other master creators such as Go Nagai and Shotaro Ishinomori, we tend to forget that he was just one of the many creators who were also forging the future path for anime and manga at the same time, and who did so with a wide variety of influences. For one thing, his contemporaries Hayao Miyazaki and Isao Takahata also were inspired by the animation from America, and you can definitely see it in their work. 
but they don't cite it as a major influence as Tezuka does. Takahata himself cited the 1952 French film The King and the Mockingbird as a prime influence on his work, while Miyazaki cited Toei's debut film, 1958's Panda and the Magic Serpent, as being the work that pushed him into pursuing animation as a career. And then there are the creators who drew almost exclusively from the works of Japanese animators and artists and still had just as much influence as Tezuka, namely Machiko Hasegawa, the first female manga artist whose long-running Sazai-san helped popularize not only the four comma format that comedy manga frequently uses, but also the slice of life genre of anime. We also can't forget the staff of Mushi Production, the people that helped Tezuka get anime like Astro Boy on the air in the first place. Directors such as Osamu Dezaki and Rintaro, storyboarders such as Yoshiyuki Tomino, writers such as Eiichi Yamamoto, animators such as Kazuko Nakamura, Masami Hata, and Shingo Araki all of whom are just as important figures as Tezuka for helping shape anime into what it is today. The point is, is that while American animation was an important factor in influencing the rise of anime into the cultural juggernaut that we see it today, it was just one of the factors. The animators that came before were still very important pioneers who had helped lay the groundwork for people like Tezuka, Miyazaki, and Takahata to take the next step. We only tend to forget them because of just how hard their work is to come across, even though they were just as important as the three above. Anime without the influence of American animation would be very different today, but let's face it, without the three fathers of anime laying the foundation of the craft, without animators like Kenzo Masaoka helping streamline the animation process by bringing over cell animation, without directors like Mitsuyo Seo proving that Japanese animation was a viable art form meant for the theaters, there would be no Japanese anime. Do you want to know what the movie that inspired Osamu Tezuka to become an artist? It wasn't a Disney movie, nor was it a Fleischer short, but it was Seo's Momotaro Sacred Sailors. American animation was one very important factor in helping define what anime and manga is, but it was also just one. Mm -hmm.